Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. In the meshless name of Yahoshua Mashiach, this is Yahweh's servant, Reginald M. Graham. And we're delighted to be able to come to you once again with another message from the word of Yahweh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has come out of her, my people, broadcast with your host, Reginald M. Graham. And we're so grateful for Yahweh giving us this opportunity, privilege to come to you, to the whole world, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we want all our friends uh, to know that we on YouTube and we would like you to go to a man, our YouTube channel and subscribe. You get that information on my page. Uh, we would love you to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. All of our friends, we thank Yahweh for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have been doing a series on the Hebrew Israelites, ladies and gentlemen. And so we're going to continue uh, our series, amen, concerning this subject. I want to entitle this broadcast this evening, The Truth of Black Hebrew Israelites in West Africa. The verdict is in. The Truth of Black Hebrew Israelites in West Africa. The verdict is in. Today, I want to continue the discussion of the claim that black Hebrew Israelites are the descendants of the ancient Israelites. The position we want to discuss is from the historical perspective of Rudolf Winsor in his book, From Babylon Timbuktu. I choose this analysis of Black Hebrew Israelite history because his book is the most celebrated book within the Black Hebrew Israelite community. So let's keep that in mind. His primary position is that Black Hebrew Israelites communities left the so-called Middle East and ended up in West Africa, maintaining their history, culture, laws, and written records. And also that they did not absorb into the West African culture at all. This idea is a extremely difficult thing to subscribe to given fundamental West African history. The history of the Black Hebrew Israelite community is very interesting. And they have uh, communities all throughout the African diaspora and in Africa itself. The only problem from the outside observer seem to be the conflation of this history. Using this color of truth to paint all black people as members of a new belief due to an overzealous discovery can garner some serious issues. When you look at the history of the black Hebrew Israelites, we will understand how this all happen. Hebrew Israelite history started a very long time ago. Most people will begin Hebrew Israelite history in the late 19th century, but I am taking a different approach. The truth is the religious foundation for the Hebrew Israelite ideology began with slavery in the U.S. when Afri African American slaves began to hear biblical stories, they immediately identified spiritually with the plight of the Israelites. For, for, for African-Americans identifying 
spiritually with the Israelites gave them a sustained hope that the Most High would deliver Israel, will surely deliver them. And their slave songs, they made statements such as, my Lord, deliver Daniel. Oh, why not deliver me too? They also sung, come along Moses. Don't you get lost. We are the people of God. So we can see very early on that enslaved African Americans in the United States were laying down the psychological framework needed to identify with the ancient Israelites. In the late 19th and early 20th century, certain African Americans began not only to identify spiritually with the ancient Israelites, but also claim that they were their direct physical descendants. In 1886, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a man named Frank Charity claimed Yahweh told him to present the message that African Americans are the true descendants of the biblical Israelites. Then William S. Crowdy, who founded the Church of God and Saints in Christ in, 19, in 1896 in Kansas with the claim that the 10 lost tribes of Israel were the ancestors of black people from the beginning of the 15th century up to the second half of the 20th century. The lost tribe idea have been an essential part of the European and colonial narrative and discourse. In other words, the lost tribe obsession from the start originated amongst European religious imagination. This was adopted black, by black people in America who had every reason to find parallels between the suffering of the ancient Israelites and their own traumatic experience of slavery and Jim Crow. Fortunately, this new idea for many black Hebrews relieved the pressures of being descendants of Africans and having to deal with the Western world view of that identifying with the, the, rom the romanticized plight of the Hebrew Israelites. Granted, African Americans access to sympathize and the respect for their humanity. For particular sets within the Hebrew Israelite camp, like Rudolph Winsor, the author of the book from Babylon Timbuktu, this new identity afforded them the opportunity to separate themselves from the Africans and join in the 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 generation, the get, denigration rather, the denigration of African society and civilization. In order to insist that their presence, the presence of the black Hebrew Israelites in Africa, brought some superiority, an idea that Rudolf Winsor clearly states himself in his book, Babylon Timbuktu, the argument from Rudolf Winsor have strong undercurrents of black Hebrew Israelite superiority over Africans. Rudolf Winsor wrote, the Jews had settled among the most civilized people throughout the ages. The Jews imported into the western part of Africa a superior material, educational, and moral culture soon afterwards, 300 AD. Rudolf Winsor degraded African culture and civilization. So essentially, Dr. Rudolf Winsor, West Africans, 
were less civilized and strife with more and culture bankruptcy. And so the black Hebrews, in a sense, gave them the light, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say that again. Rudolf Winsor degraded African culture and civilization. So essentially, Dr. Rudolf Winsor, West Africans were less civilized. He said that West Africans were less civilized and strife with more and cultural bankruptcy. And so the black Hebrews, in a sense, gave them light. The problem with that statement is that it mirrors the racist view of Arabs and Europeans who justified the enslavement of African people because they had no civilization nor respectable societal values. On the contrary, here are some honest records from early times concerning the empire of Ghana, which were in West African empire that was neither Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. A certain king of Ghana in the 7th century AD called Kansanesia possessed 1,000 horses and how each of the horses slept only on a carpet with a silken rope for halter and had three personal attendants as if itself were a king. <laughs> the horse, a man, was uh, of itself a king. The king of Ghana <clears throat> is the richest king on the face of the earth. The king of Ghana has a palace and a number of dome dwellings all surrounded with an enclosure like a city wall. He sits in audience for to hear grievance against officials in a dome pavilion around which stands 10 horses covered with gold and broaded materials behind the king. Behind the king stand pages holding shields and swords decorated with gold. And on his right are the sons of the kings of his country wearing splendid garments and their hair plaited with gold. The African kings of Aguda or Ghana had an appreciation for structure, order, beauty, and administration Acumens. They did not need Abrahamic religion in order to obtain a civilized moral compass. When confronted about historical inconsistencies in relations to two Hebrew Israelite, ten um, two Hebrew Israelites tend to pull out what they view as a trump card. They point out that maps made prior to the mid-1700s have the kingdom of Judah on them. And indeed, a kingdom called Judah are on these maps. They say that Europeans are trying to hide this history because after the 1700s, this kingdom disappeared and it is called something else. For an individual that does not know African history, this will be the most compelling evidence for black Hebrew Israelites civilizations in West Africa. But upon further analysis of West African history, we begin to see a different picture to begin with the indigenous name for the kingdom was called Weda not Judah, Weda, which literally means house of the serpents. But the French called it Wida or Uwuda. When the Portuguese arrived in that region, they called it a Judah, which literally means help in Portuguese. And since then, the name of the kingdom has been called either Wida, Weda 
or Judah. Judah simply being a British corruption of the word and since Emmanuel Bowen, the creator of the West African map, was British himself, he simply called it the kingdom of Judah or Wida. He clearly made reference to it more original French name so that people may understand the conspiracy within some of the Hebrew Israelite community this is. Well, if they are, this is the conspiracies that the Hebrew Israelites, amen, say today. Well, if they are not trying to hide our true Israelite identity, why did the kingdom of Judah suddenly disappear from all the maps in the mid-1700s? Because indeed, the maps after the mid-1700s don't have the kingdom of Judah on it. And it's called something else. That is the conspiracy within. But the answer to this question is very simple. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer to this question is very simple. The kingdom of Wida or Judah disappeared from the map in the mid 1700s because it was conquered by the kingdom of Dahomey. Ironically, the end of the kingdom of Judah or Wida was at the skilled hands of, of, of Dahomey female warriors. The first definite use of women as soldiers by the kingdom of Dahomey was in 1729. The king of Dahomey King Agassa ordered a great number of women to be armed like soldiers and appointed officers to watch company with colors, drums, and umbrellas, symbols of ranks according to the Negro fashion, then ordering the army to march the women soldiers were placed in the rear to prevent discovery. When they came in sight of the Wide army, the latter were much surprised to see such numbers of the homey soldiers as they supposed them all to be marching against them. If you are not convinced yet that the kingdom Wida was not a Hebrew Israelite kingdom at all and never claimed to be, Let's look at the society itself and their beliefs. According to Rudolf Winsor, the black Hebrew Israelites, upon their arrival in West Africa, maintained their culture, history, yet this is not at all reflected in the history of Judah and Wada. Number one, because the inhabitants of the region never called their kingdom Judah. It was called Wida. The indigenous people there in West Africa called their kingdom Wida. They never called it Judah. And as I mentioned before, Wida literally means house of serpents. Why would these people call their kingdom the house of serpents for the reason is in their religion, ladies and gentlemen. This is why they called it the house of serpents, because it is their religion. In reference to their religion of Wida or Judah, the sources have this to say, the one element that attract, that attract regular notice and commentary was the cult of the snake god. These people worship the snake god, Dangbe. This was generally recognized as deriving from pre dahomean days. Hebrew Israelite camps use the weak argument that the ancient Israelites worship Nehushtan, the brazen serpent that Yahweh 
instructed Moses to make in the wilderness and that the black Hebrew Israelites worship Nehushtan upon their arrival in West Africa. Many kingdoms in West Africa worship the snake god. The kingdom of Wade cult of the snake god have no connection with Nehushtan, the brazen serpent that Moses made in the wilderness. 2 Kings 18 and 4 declares, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Hezekiah had this uh, brazen serpent, amen, destroyed ladies and gentlemen, broke in pieces, and he uh, demolished it and got rid of it, ladies and gentlemen. Before the conquering of the kingdom of Wade of Judah, which again was named by the French and the British, these African clearly venerated and worshiped a snake god they call Dangbe. Some Hebrew Israelites said, that these people were from the tribe of Dan, ladies and gentlemen, because the serpent named Dan Bay, so they were of the tribe of Dan. And actually, they was worshiping a man, Nehushtan, but that's not true, ladies and gentlemen. Glory to Yahweh. Uh, West African tribes always worship a man, a snake god. And there's many uh, West African, a man, tribes that worship the snake god even today, ladies and gentlemen. Before the conquering of the kingdom of Wade or Judah, which again was named by the French and the British, these Africans clearly venerated and worship a snake god they call Dangbe, similar to how the Sanaka of, of the Ghana Empire venerated a snake deity. In fact, an illustration by European visitors to the kingdom of Judah or Wade during the coronation of the king, you can clearly, ladies and gentlemen, see the, the, the snake's presence right in the middle of the whole possession. There was a snake, ladies and gentlemen, when the European visitors came to witness this coronation of a king in the kingdom of Wade or Judah, there was a snake right there in the midst of the whole possession, ladies and gentlemen, because their religion clearly demonstrates their worship of snakes. So we have to ask ourselves a question. If what the Hebrew Israelites are saying is correct, about the kingdom of Wade or Judah being a black Hebrew kingdom, then why would the Hebrews be worshiping a snake, especially during a pivotal time of crowning a king? A moment in which your beliefs and history should be on full display, which they were. It's because, ladies and gentlemen, they worship the snake. Ladies and gentlemen, it's be, it it's becomes very difficult to conclude that the kingdom Wade, Judah, Ghana, or Sangai were black Hebrew states. When we understand West African history, ladies and gentlemen, when we understand West African history, history, culture, and religion, now the argument from some conservative Hebrew Israelites tend to excuse this historical narrative because they claim that black Hebrews simply be began to worship other gods and forgot who they were. They point to the fact that they did this throughout their history. 
The problem for an outside observer is that you cannot simultaneously proclaim that the black Hebrews maintained their culture, laws, written records, and did not absorb into the African populace via Rudolf Winsor claim, and also that they forgot their language, culture, and laws, but there ex existed a kingdom of Judah in West Africa, alluding that there were black Hebrews who knew who they were. These two liberal and conservative black Hebrew Israelite historical perspectives cannot coexist. Given their collective evidential claims, the black Hebrew Israelites' most powerful biblical argument, one of the most convincing claim from the Hebrew Israelite, comes straight from the Bible and Deuteronomy chapter 28. This chapter is one of the Hebrew Israelites' primarily piece of evidence for the Hebrew Israelite community. Even in popular culture, the overwhelming majority of Hebrew Israelites believe that the transatlantic slave trade was predicted in Deuteronomy 28 and 68. It declares, and Yahweh shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. These verse, this verse rather, the black Hebrew Israelites used to try to confirm the transatlantic voyage of black Hebrews. For most black Hebrews, Egypt here is, is a spiritual reference or metaphor for America or the Americas. And part about, ladies and gentlemen, about that, no man will buy you simply means no man shall save you, according to the Hebrew Israelites. So we see in the scripture where it says, amen, in, in, in Deuteronomy 28 and 68, that no man will buy you, they interpret that to mean no man will save you, ladies and gentlemen, that no man shall save you. I don't know how they get saved from the word by, but the Hebrew Israelites make this verse work for them. They make it work for them, ladies and gentlemen. History records that, that Ptolemy II, Macedonian pharaoh of Egypt in the fourth century BC, listen to this, loaded Israelite slaves on ships from the land of Israel and sailed them to Egypt to work in the copper mines in Egypt. This is document. This is true facts. This is history, ladies and gentlemen. First century Jewish scholar, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Flavius Josephus wrote that in 70 AD, now Josephus is a Jewish historian scholar, ladies and gentlemen. Josephus wrote that in 70 AD, that Jerusalem was taken by Roman Emperor Titus and he took enslaved Israelites on ships again into Egypt. We see this happen two times in history, ladies and gentlemen. We see there's many holes, ladies and gentlemen, in their ideology, in their theology. Thomas Newton, biblical scholar and author, also points out the fallen theological thought concerning the Israelite reference of Deuteronomy 28. They had come out of Egypt triumphant, but now they should return thither as slaves. 
They had walked through the sea as dry land at their coming out, but now they should be carried thither in ships. They might be carried thither in the ships of the Tyrians and Sidonians merchants or by the Romans who had a fleet in the Mediterranean Sea. And this was a much safer way of conveying so many prisoners than sending them by land. Now, historian Josephus, ladies and gentlemen, also gives commentary as to the last portion of the biblical prophecy from his perspective in, in reference to no man should buy you. Josephus wrote of the captives who were above 17 years, he sent many bound to the works in Egypt. Those under 17 were sold, but so little care was taken of these captives that 11,000 of them perished for want. Josephus, by the way, have claimed to witness himself the taking of Jerusalem. He lived in the first century, ladies and gentlemen, when Jerusalem was taken by Emperor, Roman Emperor Titus. So jo Josephus, by the way, have claimed to witness himself the taking of Jerusalem by Emperor Titus, and he was under his protection. Whatever perspective that we want to subscribe to, the fact remains that there are older interpretations of the scriptures from a man of that time who claimed to see Jews being murdered and persecuted and loaded on slave ships. Ladies and gentlemen, and sent to Egypt on ships. He witnessed this with his own eyes, which does align with the biblical prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 and 68. Given this history, there are conservative Hebrew Israelites that don't deny what historian Josephus says in his first hand account, because he was actually there. Josephus was there and witnessed this, ladies and gentlemen. But they believe that event was just a part of the prophecy. They proclaim that the transatlantic slave trade was the second portion and completion of the biblical prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The historical proclamation of the black Hebrew Israelites are somewhat compelling on the surface level. But when you begin to dig deeper, ladies and gentlemen, there's many, many discrepancies. But the main issue seems to be the conflation of history and the romanticized feeling of historical gaps. Historians also recorded that Roman Emperor Hadrian in the second century AD transported enslaved Israelites from the land of Israel to Egypt on ships to labor in the mines there in Egypt. Deuteronomy 28, 68 was fulfilled in ancient time, many centuries ago. Now I want to bring out another point here in Deuteronomy chapter number 28 that I hear many uh, black Hebrew Israelites fail a man to expound on. But Deuteronomy chapter 28, beloved, and verse 53, Deuteronomy 28, 53, and thou shalt eat the fruit of thy own body, the flesh of thy sons, and of thy daughters, which Yahweh thy Elohim have given thee in the siege, and the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. Listen, listen. Ladies and gentlemen, the people that came, that was uh, kidnapped from Africa and loaded 
on slave ships, ladies and gentlemen. Never succumb, succumb to cannibalism. They never ate their children. That's a big red flag, ladies and gentlemen. If those that left the west coast of Africa during the transatlantic slave trade were descendants of ancient Israelites, ladies and gentlemen, glory to Yahweh. These people that were loaded on these ships that went to the Western Hemisphere never succumbed to cannibalism, to eating their own children. But the Bible teaches us that the ancient Israel, Israelites, the ancient Israelites in scriptures we see time and time again in the book of Jeremiah, we can read in the book of Kings, ladies and gentlemen, where they succumb to cannibalism, eating their own children, ladies and gentlemen. But the people that was loaded on slave ships during the transatlantic slave trade never succumbed, ladies and gentlemen, to cannibalism, showing us that they cannot possibly be, ladies and gentlemen, descendants of the ancient Israelites. The kingdom of Wida or Judah, these people were not Israelites. The name of the kingdom was Wida, Wida. When the French, the Portuguese, and the British came, they changed the name from Wida to Wida to Ojuda, ladies and gentlemen. They changed the names. And then the British, ladies and gentlemen, changed the name to Judah. It's a corrupt, ladies and gentlemen, translation of Wida. Bless the name of Yahweh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the proof is in the pudding. This is the acid test, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. It doesn't line up with scripture. I don't care how people want uh, to make this seem true. It is not true. It's too many red flags. It doesn't line up with scripture. The Bible say out of the mouth of two or three, amen, witnesses, let every word be established. Ladies and gentlemen, there are contradictions in this theology. There are holes in this theology. There are many discrepancies in this theology. Uh, the book Babylon, Timbuktu, is bogus, ladies and gentlemen. It is historically inaccurate. It does not line up with scripture. Now, if these people were actually Hebrews in the kingdom of Wida, the kingdom of Judah, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't they have kept their language, their culture, and their customs, and their history, and recorded, uh, written, amen, recorded, amen, history, ladies and gentlemen? Wouldn't they have kept all of these things? Ladies and gentlemen, they didn't speak the language. Ladies and gentlemen, they didn't have recorded, uh, written uh, record of this. They did not have written record of this. They did not have the culture, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened? Because these people are not descendants of ancient Israelites. The facts are clear, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us to prove all things, hold fast that that which is good. And the scripture tells us, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether they be of Elohim. So we test the spirit, we try the spirit by the word of Yahweh, and this do not add up with scripture, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Many of our people have been seduced by demons and devils. Many of our people have been opened up, ladies and gentlemen, to doctrines of devils. 
It's not sound. It's not biblically accurate. It's not historically accurate. And it's not scientifically accurate, ladies and gentlemen. Matter of fact, <laughs> they did DNA on these people and they do not have the Y DNA, ladies and gentlemen. They don't have Y DNA. The ancient Israelites have Y DNA, ladies and gentlemen. We, the African Americans, ladies and gentlemen, those living in the Americas, black people living in the Americas and the Western Hemisphere, they are not, ladies and gentlemen, they are not the descendants of ancient Israelites, ladies and gentlemen. There's no way possible they can be. I don't care how much we try to make something right that's not right, ladies and gentlemen. Glory to Yahweh. So what we need to do is throw down being biased, throw down our racism, let go of our prejudiceness, ladies and gentlemen, let go of these things and accept the word of Yahweh for what it is saying. Let's not make a doctrine. Let's not make something that's not true, ladies and gentlemen, to justify glory to Yahweh, our theology and our ideology, ladies and gentlemen. Bless the name of Yahweh, amen, for his truth. Remember Yahushua said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now I want you, those that will go to this, listen to this message on YouTube and on Facebook, many of you will, I want you to go and I want you to look, amen, at our other messages. We've done a series on this. I have four other messages on this subject, ladies and gentlemen. Go to our YouTube and listen to the other messages, ladies and gentlemen. I have not brought out everything in this message that I brought out in the other messages, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, other messages, we use more scripture. We went into more specifics and details, amen, concerning, amen, this Hebrew Israelite devilish, diabolical teaching, ladies and gentlemen. I want to bring out another point in Deuteronomy 28, ladies and gentlemen, and verse number 30. But before I say this, bring this point out. Listen, if someone, ladies and gentlemen, if, if, if the kingdom of Wida, the kingdom that the British renamed Judah, ladies and gentlemen, if the kingdom of Wida, if these people were Hebrews, if they were Hebrew Israelites, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't they have kept their culture? Huh? Wouldn't they have written record? Wouldn't they have uh, some of the Hebrew Israelite cultures? Wouldn't they even speak the language? How was they able to lose the language? Now, in the book, Timbuktu, Lady Babylon Timbuktu, uh, Rudolph Winsor said that these people did not absorb into the African indigenous population there in West Africa. If they didn't, why did they lose their language? Why did they lose their culture? Why did they lose their written records, ladies and gentlemen? Glory to Yahweh. Because these people are not Israelites and never been Israelites and never professed to be Hebrew Israelites, ladies and gentlemen. Glory to Yahweh. Thank Yahweh for the truth. But in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter number 28, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to look at verses number 39. And thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine. Now, they're going to plant vineyards, the scripture says, but they will never drink of the wine. The West Coast of Africa, beloved, they do not grow vineyards. 
okay? They, they don't grow vineyards there. The weather is not conducive for them to grow vineyards. These people cannot be the uh, descendants of the he ancient Hebrew Israelites of the Bible. Look at this. And it goes on. It says, thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, in West Africa, listen to me, there are not olive trees. They do not grow olives, edible olives. They have ornamental olives that you can't eat and get oil from them, amen, ladies and gentlemen. But they never had olives. They never had, amen, olive trees because the weather is not conducive, ladies and gentlemen, of, for growing olives. Glory to Yahweh. Olives was grown in Northern Africa. The vengeance was grown in Northern Africa. Olives was grown in Italy, Greece, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and these re Turkey and these regions, amen, of the earth, in ancient time, not in West Africa, ladies and gentlemen. African Americans are not descendants, ladies and gentlemen, of Hebrew, ancient Hebrew Israelites. They are not the descendants, ladies and gentlemen, of ancient Israelites. It is impossible. The scientific evidence proved it. Ladies and gentlemen, historic evidence proved it. And biblical evidence prove that they are not. The verdict is in, ladies and gentlemen. The verdict is in. We are not, ladies and gentlemen, we are not. It is impossible. It cannot be. We are not, ladies and gentlemen, descendants of ancient Israelites. We are Hamitic people. We are not Shemitic people. Why? Wouldn't why won't black people, amen? Why wouldn't African Americans accept their identity? We're the only people on the earth that don't want to be Africans. Chinese want to be Chinese, Europeans want to be Europeans, ladies and gentlemen. Hispanic want to be Hispanic. Glory to Yahweh. These people want to be who they are. Japanese want to be Japanese. Filipinos want to be Philippines. North Koreans and South Koreans want to be who they are. But we're the only people. We're the only people on the earth that deny our heritage. Deny, ladies and gentlemen, who we are. My goodness. What's wrong with black? What's wrong with being African? What's wrong? Black is beautiful. What's wrong with being black? My goodness. My goodness. Why we want to be something that we're not? Ladies and gentlemen, the, the ancient Israelites were Shemitic people. They were not Hamitic people. Glory to Yah. We are from our father is Ham. Glory to Yahweh. Noah had Three sons. He had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham was the youngest. Japheth was the middle son. And I'm, I'm sorry, Shem was the middle son. And Japheth was the eldest son. And three, these three boys made up all the races. Amen. Glory to Yahweh on the earth. And black people, ladies and gentlemen, we are hermetic. Amen. Uh, Ham is a father. We are not. Amen. Descendants of ancient Israelite. And they teach. I brought out this in my other teaching. That, that Latinos and Native Americans, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, are descendants of the ancient Israelite. But Latinos and Native Americans, they have discovered, they have found out the scientific evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that they have the same DNA. <laughs> Glory to Yahweh. The same DNA as Ashkenazis. 
as Europeans, listen, Mexican, Latinos, Native Americans, ladies and gentlemen, they are Japhetic people. They are Japhetic people, ladies and gentlemen. They came, amen, from, amen, Siberia, amen, which are uh, uh, Semitic, I'm sorry, which are Japhetic people. Glory to Yahweh. Amen. They have the same DNA. Listen to me. Then the Ashkenazis have. So, man, it's so many holes in this teaching. It's so many holes in this teaching. Glory to Yahweh. But we thank Yahweh. Amen for the truth, friend. We thank Yahweh for the truth. Their arguments are very weak. Three times in history, I, I've showed you the evidence. I've given you proof. Three times in history, ladies and gentlemen, ancient Israelites went to Egypt on ships, slave ships, three times. Can I repeat it? Roman Emperor Titus, during the wars, the, the, the Israelite wars, amen, between 66 and 70 day AD and 70 AD, he took them into Egypt on slave ships, enslaved Israelites, took them to Egypt. See, listen, most people that are part of the Hebrew Israelite, ladies and gentlemen, movement, they don't know history. This is how they was able to reel these people in. Hook, line, and sinker, bamboozle them. Amen. Pull the wool over their eyes because they don't know history. And many of them don't know the scriptures, ladies and don't know the word of Yahweh. And so if someone give you bogus history, ladies and gentlemen, if someone give you history that been distorted and fabricated, if you don't know history, you'll fall for it. The scriptures say my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and because they rejected knowledge. Yahweh said, I have rejected them. Okay, history. Josephus. I know many of you reject Josephus, the scholar and historian Josephus Flavius. He was there and witnessed it with his eyes and wrote it down in history what he's seen. He's seen Titus, a man, uh, 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 a slowed up enslaved Israelites and take them to Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, and take them to Egypt. Glory to Yahweh. In the 4th century BC, Ptolemy, the Macedonian Pharaoh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, one of Alexander the Great, amen, generals, ladies and gentlemen, took over Egypt and proclaimed himself Pharaoh. And he, ladies and gentlemen, enslave Israelites and brought them from Israel to Egypt to work in the copper mines. Two time. I'm not through. And Hadrian, Roman Emperor Hadrian in the second century took Israelites from the land of Israel, loaded them on slave ships, enslaved Israelites, and took them to Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, in the second century. The verdict is in. What are you going to do with the evidence? Glory to God. What are you going to do with the evidence? This is sound doctrine, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here little and there little. This is sound, ladies and gentlemen. Praise the name of Yahweh. This is sound doctrine. Praise his holy name. I'm going to conclude. But Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, he told his son Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come in the end times when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but heap after their own lust, teachers having itching ears, listen, and will turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The black Hebrew Israelite movement is based on fables, is based on lies, fabrication, stories, make-believe, fairy tales, a fallacy, a fable, something that ain't even true. For an example, let me, I'm going to close, but I got to read this. I want to read one more scripture to you. I have many, many, many more. Glory to Yahweh. And if I get feedback, I look at my feedback. I, I check. Glory to Yahweh. Amen. What type of feedback we'll get if I will continue on with this message. But in Revelation, I want to read this, ladies and gentlemen, because they take the, look. At, let me show you how they subvert the scripture. Let me show you how they, the scriptures say they they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. Second uh, uh, Peter chapter two, they rest the scripture. What rests me? They twist the scriptures. Then the Bible says, I want to read this to you too. And the Bible says in second Corinthians, watch this, watch this. Second Corinthians, praise Yahweh, chapter four. Look what it says here. Look what it says here. It says in verse two, it says, but have denounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of Elohim deceitfully. You see that? We're not walking in craftiness. The Hebrew Israelites, the leaders, they walk in craftiness, ladies and gentlemen. They are dishonest. They know this, that what they're teaching is not true. Look, and... Uh, they handled the word of Yahweh deceitfully. They take it and twist it and they prey on ignorant, unknowledgeable people, on unknowledgeable black Africans, amen, uh, 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 African Americans, ladies and gentlemen, black Americans, Latinos, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Brazilians and Haitians, and others living in the Caribbean, ladies and gentlemen, they they pray on them, they pray on them, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, then the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of Elohim. They corrupt the word of Elohim. Look at this, pervert it, subvert it, twist it up, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. But as of sincerity, but as of Elohim and the sight of Elohim, speak we in Mashiach. They don't have the evidence. Bible say, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So many holes, so many contradictions. Ladies and so much chaos, so much confusion. Yahweh is not the altar of confusion, but of peace. And as I said before, the camps fight amongst one another. There's so much dissension, so much division amongst them, ladies and gentlemen. They don't even agree with one another. They fight amongst one another and use profanity when they, and, and they physically fight. And then they're out on the street with their, their costumes on. They got on these outfits they have that they put on and they get out there and they use a vulgar language profanity ladies and gentlemen uh cursing at white people telling them blue they blue eyed devils they they we y'all gonna be our slaves and y'all y'all women gonna be our sex slaves and, and all of this foolishness ladies and gentlemen that ain't the spirit of Yahweh that ain't the spirit of Yahweh glory to Yahweh this is how these people, amen, uh, act, ladies and gentlemen. They use profanity. I'm talking about MF, SOBs. I'm talking about the foulest mouth. I mean, they got yuck mouth. I mean, filthy mouth. The Bible says, let no filthy communication proceed out of their mouth. They don't want to deal with these scriptures. They don't want to deal with this. But let me, let me, let me share something with you. 
They love using this scripture too. This is one of their scriptures that they tried to convince people that Yahushua was a black man. First of all, let me say this. Yahushua was not white. We know he wasn't Caucasian. He was not from the, the lineage of Japheth, but he was a man of color. He was from the lineage of Abraham. He was a Hebrew. He was a man of color, olive color, brown skin, probably my complexion, but he was not a black man, ladies and gentlemen, with kinky hair. Lord, glory to Yahweh, with nappy, naughty hair. He was not a black man, okay? He was a man of color. Glory to Yahweh. But look what they say. They tried to convince people that Yahushua was jet black. Now look what they say. I'm going to read the scripture to you. Listen, if you have a little education, uh, I would say a seventh grade education, you understand this. Listen what it says. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Now look what it said. Now where are you going to get black out of this? I don't understand. His head. What is his head? His head is his face. And his hairs. What is his hair? His hair on his head and his beard. Look what it said. Were white like wool. Wool is lamb's wool is white. Is white. White like wool. Now that is very simple. That is simple English there. As white as snow. So his head and his hairs now are white as snow. Snow is pure white. White. It don't say anything about the texture of his hair. They say he got hair like wool. It don't say anything like that. It doesn't say that he has hair like wool. It, said his, it says his head and his hairs was white like wool. White like wool. Not the texture of wool, but it was white. The color of wool. Let's talk about the color. Let's stay in the context of the scripture and talking about texture. As white as snow. And his eyes were as flame of fire. This is metamorphic, um, 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 uh, uh, metaphor rather. This is a metaphor. This is symbolic, symbolism. Ladies and gentlemen, his, his eyes were as flame of fire. Now, just think of it. If he was white, they say this is literally. This is not literally. This is symbolic. This is a metaphor. Now, if it was literal, literal, Ladies and gentlemen, it means he got a white head, he's got a white face, he got white hair, he got a white beard, and his eyes red. Even an albino ain't white. <laughs> he whiter than the albino. He whiter than the albino. How can he be black? Look, and his feet like unto fine brass. Fine brass. What color is brass? Brass look like gold. It's a, it has a goal. Amen. Appearance. Look at this. As it, as they burn in the furnace. Now, if brass is burning in the furnace, what color is it? It ain't black. It's melted. It's mel It's red, glowing red. You seen metal that's in a furnace and they melting it's glowing red. Liquefied, glowing red. Look what it is. It says, his feet like unto fine brass as it burn in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. This is symbolic. Now, if this literally, if this, if this is speaking literally how Yahushua look, let's see how he look. He got a white face. He got white hair, white beard. He got red eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, he got red glowing feet. Now, you ever seen somebody with a white face like snow, white hair like snow, white beard like snow, with red eyes and red feet? Ladies and gentlemen, look at the discoloration. That's freakish. And we know this is symbolic. 
We know Yahushua don't look freakish or have a freakish appearance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is symbolic. Well, I'm going to stop here tonight. I can go on, but we're going to stop. We thank Yahweh for you tuning in with us. Amen. This evening, I pray that Yahweh would touch the hearts, amen, of his people that's being led astray into false teachings and false doctrines. Ladies and gentlemen, I pray for you today. Amen. I pray that Yahweh will reveal that you will humble yourself and just receive the, the spoken word of Yahweh. Don't add, don't take away, amen, from his word. Don't alter the word of Yahweh, ladies and gentlemen. We, I titled the day, The Truth of Black Hebrew Israelites in West Africa. The verdict is in. The verdict is in. They never been there, ladies and gentlemen. They never been there as a, 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 a nation or a tribe of people. They never been there. So we thank Yahweh, amen, for you tuning in once again. Amen. Yahweh's willing, we'll be back on tomorrow, amen, the same time. Amen. May Yahweh continue to bless you and smile on you is our prayers.